Okay, guys. Let's start. In times like these, being a citizen is a big job. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the virtues of self-rule and debate the state of our republic. Welcome to the Citizens Prerogative Podcast. This is the voice of your nerdy host, Michael Piscatelli, and we are inspired by a co-host whose passion for our republic precedes him everywhere he goes, Raymond Wong Jr. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just want you to know I'm an ally of all allies and those allies of their allies. Lovely. Yeah, we're still in season three, heading towards the end, final stretch here. Um, Episode number 62, and the title of this episode should be The Allies for Our Lives. So this title is maybe a little bit ambiguous to some people, but um, just to be clear, the topic we're going to be talking about today are uh, those people in our lives that we need, we, we all need each other. And we may not always belong to the same groups or believe in the same things, but as humans trying to coexist and make our way through liberty and justice for all under this republic, we still need each other and we need to support each other um, as much as we can. And it requires each of us to extend beyond our little circle and be allies for one another um, across the board. So we'll jump into it just with some more perspective here. Um, Why we use the term allies, uh, you know, you could look up the definition and that might explain it directly, but for people of the United States, we like to hearken back to our world wars. Um, when we took history class, the limited version we received in school, generally the first time we become aware of the term ally is in relation to the world wars. And it was the idea of those mm, fighting for freedom and against tyranny um, you know, versus the tyrannicals. And it was a union of like Europe and the United States and Canada, et cetera those relatively self-representative systems against the fascists, the Nazis, and um, whatever we called the version of totalitarianism that was in Japan at the time. Just as the allied nations of the world wars past continue to this day to battle in the struggle against tyranny. So kind of hearkening to Russia versus Ukraine, Um, We as individuals need to be allies to the community of common good, and we must do the same for one another. We need to be allies for one another for the sake of common good. Equal liberty and justice under law can only be established if the plurality of Americans that have an equal footing to gain band together in solidarity especially those who are least wealthy among us, which represents something like the 98% of Americans, uh, regardless of your ethnic or, or religious identity, or I would even say political identity. At the end of the day, regardless of your ideation, your ideologies, humans that are not wealthy have a lot more in common you know, than those things that divide us. So let's talk a little bit about what this looks like. What is this, what is this concept of allyship that we're borrowing from the world wars and porting over to us in our individual lives? What does it look like on the ground? Just to talk through a few examples, the first one I throw out here, for a lot of reasons I, I suspect people might understand or identify with, is going to be around the LGBTQ plus community. And you know, being an ally for that community, it looks like, for instance, a straight military veteran who jumps into action to take down an armed mass shooter in a gay nightclub because they fought for the liberty for all of us to have art and free expression and the freedom to do the things that we enjoy that harm no one else. And so when we have an ally, somebody who isn't a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer, 
you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They don't identify that way, right? Straight, maybe cis, male, whatever other terms, labels we want to throw on it is still able to support the liberty of others. And I mean, I, in this case, you know, we know that there's a familial relationship among the individuals, which really just goes back to the fact that Harvey Milk told us we all need to come out of the closet so that everybody knows somebody who's LGBTQ+. And when you know someone who identifies under that umbrella, it, it helps to demystify it. You know, you, you recognize the human behind the umbrella. And then we have allies. We have allies in this war against hate, quite frankly. What else does this look like? That's just the first example I throw out there. There's a lot of ways to look at this. For instance, let's look at the individual who has a curious young mind. You know, an ally to someone that's a, a curious young mind looks like a brave teacher or a brave librarian who risks their own livelihood to provide a banned book or to discuss a cogent subject that matters to this curious individual. You know, that's a, it's a far less specific thing, but I think it's incredibly more powerful. And as a, someone who's been a young child and had a curious mind in the past and have attended um, scholastic environments of many types from public school to Montessori to Catholic, um, this idea of having a free mind and being able to have free expression and, and the freedom to explore curiosity is, is so important. It always was so important to me. And now we're moving into an era where that's being discouraged. And in some places it's against the law. And that's very scary, especially from a liberty perspective. If you want to talk about freedom of speech and what's associated to the freedom of speech and expression is basically anything that can be an idea. Um, which should not be feared. We, we should have the capacity to consider many different ideas. What else can this look like? You know, for the black person being refused service, it looks like the other employees behind the counter who shut down their confused coworker and put in place their poor business acumen because in our country in the United States and under this Republic, every dollar is still green, whether it's digital or otherwise, everybody's dollar should allow them to conduct a transaction because that is legal tender. And it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, you know, or the perspectives you bring with you when you, come into a business, a place of business to conduct a transaction. Everybody should be offered that same right to spend that dollar, to receive that service or that product, and should never be refused service because of arbitrary reasons. So anybody who stands up for an individual who's being shut down in such a way that's it's unfair, it's unlegal, or excuse me, illegal, you know, they're in that moment, they've become an ally and it may not be an ally to a label or to a group. You're being an ally to the common good, common decency, respect, and, and mutual, you know, the idea that we're all in this together at the end of the day, no matter what, um, because the Republic doesn't exist without us. This also looks like being an ally for anyone who's being ridiculed because of their color, their shape, their size, or other aspects of who they are. Being an ally looks like the anti-bully, the anti-bully who puts an attacker in their place. Again, that's very situational, but it's, it's being an ally to the common good. You know, it's an easy, a relatively easy rule to consider. And as humans, we're actually born with an innate sense about this. Um, maybe, you know, maybe we're too fearful to come to the defense of someone. But in any case that somebody has an opportunity to exhibit this anti-bully behavior, they're, they're being an ally to the common good and they're helping somebody in a moment. 
let's talk about immigrants. I mean, this country is built on immigration, whether it was forced immigration or voluntary immigration. Um, for immigrants, being an ally, you know, is being the person that recognizes and reminds us that this country was built by and is still fed from the labor of immigrants. It was built by the labor of slaves. Um, and today we have a lot of immigrants working in agriculture. And, you know, we, we don't think about that. We don't think about the end to end life cycle of our food anymore very often. I'm sure we've talked about that in the past. But to just think that immigration is some risky thing or some bad thing is it's definitely not being an ally. Being an ally is recognizing the value of immigration and the value of all the contributions that immigrants have made in the past and will make into the future because immigration is not something that can go away if we don't want the republic to stagnate and wither. I think the last group I'm going to call out on this set of bullets, at least for now, is, you know, for either the religious or the nuns, and I don't mean N-U-N-S, I mean the N-O-N-E-S, which is the new label that's emerged for people who don't identify with the religion. They have no religion. So whether you're religious or you're not, being an ally looks like having mutual respect for a live and let live way of life which at the end of the day is the essence of liberty because you believing in a religion really at the end of the day should have no impact on me believing in a different religion or none at all. Unless for some reason you think you have the right to impose your will upon me, which is a violation of liberty at its core and is not in accordance with live and let live philosophy. So we can always be an ally to one another when we stand up against hate and for the common good in defense of others if they're being attacked for the religion even if we don't have a religion um, we need to have that mutual respect for the rights of liberty that are under law and people have the right to practice their religions in this country and not experience hate i really appreciate you taking us through those examples of humanity i know that most people probably felt like we went to call to action ahead of it these are really case studies in human experience and i think that it's important to remember that as a society the more we talk about things that's the real gift out of out of anything that we possess as a power as humans, as collaborators, is that gift of, of speech, the, the ability to talk about what's going on openly and safely. That freedom of speech is really what um, you, you ca captured there, right? Is freedom of speech is not challenging your government's decision to protect everyone. Freedom of speech is not screaming at people in a boardroom. Freedom of speech is that you can become the person who is a savior. You be can become the leader in the room. You can become president of that cafe and declare a better future for everyone involved. And maybe you impact people's lives and you help them think twice. Maybe you're the first person to check them. Uh, that happens to people with the police all the time. And us as citizens, we're the first level police of our liberty because everybody gets liberty, freedom, and tranquility. So when that's violated, I have as much right to speak up on it as the next person. So uh, I feel like you've really spoken to me an exercise in what freedom of speech looks like maybe and what protection of liberty it, it looks like as well. So thank you. No, thank you for bringing all that home and wrapping it together. It's a nice gift.
I spent enough time going through all those bullets that we can take a break. Time for a message from our sponsor, Citizen Do Good. Fulfilling a dream where all possess an intrinsic love for self-rule that is reciprocated with free speech and equal justice under the law? Citizen Do Good values the promise within the Constitution and our nation's founding documents. Taken together, they form a framework and an operating manual for our republic that provides us with the means to change with the times. The time is now to deeply re-examine ourselves and our implementation of governance for the dawning of a new day. We are a proud sponsor of the Citizens Prerogative podcast, a major partner in spreading the good word about civic love and the power of change for us all. At Citizen Do Good, we want to empower all citizens to participate in their republic in a reconstructive way. With that goal in mind, we need your help to stay on mission and grow this community. Please rate the podcast with five stars on iTunes, through the app on the web, or on your device. If you don't feel like you can give us five stars, let us know why on our sponsor's Facebook page, Citizen Do Good. Also, make sure you join our newsletter at citizendogood.com. You'll get updates every few months on all of our antics, not just the podcast. Plus, you'll receive the Guide to Good Thinking by Citizen Do Good for free. Also, feel free to share any suggestions you have directly through the Contact Us page. Thanks for your support. I think I want to take us back to war and, and, and what allies mean. So as we, as we kind of talk about how do you react in this environment that, or the situations that we've brought forward is that think of ourselves as allies in, in the war. Um, many people would have said the United States waited too long to get involved. Many people would have said it was obvious that we should have been building weapons um, not refrigerators. There was a idea that we could ignore the problems going on in Europe, in America, and things would sort themselves out. And I'd say that there is no perfect way to be an ally. In the end, what matters is that, that we showed up. What matters is that we we did join the fight for the right causes out there. I think all of us have to be forgive. Um, forgiving of ourselves that we've sat back and seen these things happen and it and we're all we've all been victims of what the system and the environment has created around us which is microaggressions uh, against all types of individuals so just because you've noticed it in the past doesn't mean you should feel bad for not saying it every day is a new opportunity to act uh, the right way every day is a new opportunity to defend humanity and you don't have to say well because i didn't say it before i should just stick with it no in fact i think everybody's freedom comes from when we all agree that everyone deserves freedom freedom from oppression at all levels oppression from your family oppression from a teacher oppression from a schoolyard bully it, no one deserves oppression. As a yeah, a great way to sum it up. We need to be allies for one another and defend the common good and and our rights, right? To be free at the end of the day. And freedom requires us to respect each other's freedom and our liberty, right? It's um, it's something we have to be vigilant about, and we have to do it every day, and and every moment or opportunity we have. And I love that call out to like, you know, our our past selves have not always been the best friend to our current or future selves, but every day is still an opportunity. It's your, it's the first day for the rest of your life. Every day you wake up, and and then that's the moment. That's the day you have to be that ally to yourself to your future self, to, to your comrades here on the ground um, in, in life, because it's, it's quite a journey and it is for all of us. You know, nobody's got it all figured out. So we need to have some grace and respect for one another as much as we can and stand against hate. I mean, I, I try to, you know, it's like the simplest way I can put it. 
I, because we all have so many rules and we have so much stuff going on in our heads and our minds and in our lives and whether it's distractions or this, that, and the other thing. But the most fundamental component is, is this love versus hate aspect of things. And I just feel bad because I also think that there might be some people out there who actually don't know what love is or what it feels like. And, you know, maybe those are a lot of the people where hate is their only option, which, which would be very sad. And that's unfortunate. And, and it would be a digression from really the core of the topic around allyship we're talking about today. Maybe we'll revisit that another time. Or maybe we have in the past. In any case, um, let's go ahead and move into some of our calls to action. We do have, <laughs> we have a separate section with bullets on calls to action, uh, unlike the previous segment where it did sound like, um, you know, we're, we were embedding some, some action right in the examples we were using. But here are some things very specific that we've laid out. The first one is that we need to stand up for our human dignity during this battle for our liberty and justice. And we do that by standing up for each other everywhere in every way that we can. That is, I think, the core of being an ally. And standing up in every way <laughs> that's bringing us together towards the common good, right? Uh, not defending somebody's right to, a, to physically assault anyone else. There's no right to physically assault anyone. That's what gets you put in jail. And I think, I think we've forgotten that in a lot of ways, um, that violence is not the solution. It's never, it's never been the solution. Um, I would say that's, I was reading an article about some of our latest warships and bombers and things that were refitting uh, because of the rise of military challenges around the world. And it's like the whole point of it is deterrence. At least that's, you know, what the defense department wants us to understand is that we try to have that big military to def deter violence and, and whatnot. Now, I don't want to digress because there's arguments to be made that, <laughs> having the military means that there's going to be violence, but um, it is kind of part and parcel the the world we're still living in, unfortunately. But if we can stay on the side of the common good and be motivated by love and connectivity and honor and respect for one another and each of our inalienable rights to exist under our Republic, then I feel like we're, we're being an ally. The other bullet here we have is that we need to recognize the real string of bullies that have been ascending various thrones from business to politics and to stop promoting their messages. Um, we, it feels like, and this has happened many times throughout history, there's plenty of pendulums you can see swinging around this, this bully rhetoric, this hateful rhetoric, this divisive, disgusting appeal um, to the worst parts of human nature. I mean, we, we are born in, with all of these capabilities. It's about the wolf you feed, according to the proverb, right? There's the good wolf and the bad wolf. And which one wins the war or the battle depends on the one that you feed. And we need to be cognizant of recognizing bully ship everywhere we see it. Not to be confused with bullshit, bully ship, <laughs> the rise of the bullies. We're, we're living in a time where there's a lot of rhetoric inspiring people to rise up on the wrong side of things. A whole bunch of Sith Lords trying to rule a Republic. Another action item or call to action we have here is uh, the fact that we need to meet each moment prepared to speak truth to power in the halls where we walk and call out divisive commentary and divisive thinking as we encounter it from others to do our best to nip these buds before they bloom in every little way we can. Ray, you mentioned like microaggressions and, and things like that it is a prime example of this. You know, we're you could be interacting with a colleague or a friend or, or something and some 
subconscious thing slips out, maybe something from their upbringing or some ideology that maybe it's a bias, maybe it's rooted in some bias that they're not even really cognitively aware of. And it takes those moments for us to stand up and be an ally to that individual to, to make sure that they understand, hey, well, wait a minute, <laughs> can I ask you about this thing you just said? Or can you explain this perspective that you have on something? Because um, people aren't always aware of their, their own device of nature um, or their own, I don't know, predilection towards hate or seeing others in an other way. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to undo our programming, um, depending on how we were raised and, and the environments we've been in. There's a lot of things we just don't always question all the time. And so it does take each of us to stand up and be an ally for one another when we see some of that automatic programming and we're like, Hey, I don't know. Is that, that doesn't seem like you really, do you really believe in that? Whatever it might be. And the best times, I think the most effective times for those conversations are in those moments, in those moments where you're actually in the middle of working together to solve a problem or whatever it is. And this thing just kind of slips up and maybe our nature, our kind, loving nature wants to just let it go by. We don't want to rock the boat in this case because we're solving a problem, but that actually ends up being the most critical juncture to do that because that's the moment where you both, whoever that colleague is or whoever it is you're working with recognizes the mutual need and the mutual aid you have among one another to solve this problem or to move this thing forward or get this thing done. And so when we're bound together in that common moment trying to solve something, is the best time for us to be a little vulnerable with each other. Um, and we're more open and receptive to each other because we're, we're actually already working together on some things. It's almost like coming out of the closet in a micro way. <laughs> the last call to action we have noted here is that we need to show care to one another, especially when it's unexpected. Um, you know, and that's just coming back to like paying things forward. And if there are people walking among us in our lives that have not experienced a significant amount of love or care, then it's never too late for them to potentially receive it and to potentially be open to it. But if it's not something that's ever expressed to them, if we, if nobody ever really shows care to another individual, then then there's no opportunity for them to experience it and know what it is. And so I feel like we have an obligation to be an ally to each other in that way. And I think it's being an ally to the common good to show that care, you know, especially when it's unexpected, because a lot of times that's when it's going to, it's going to stick out. It's going to be noticeable. It's going to maybe give somebody a moment of pause and be like, wow, nobody's treated me like that before or nobody's been that kind to me or, or has responded in that way. Um, and, and caring can come in many shapes and forms. I mean, in business and Ray, I think, you know, you can identify with this as well. There's a lot of people who have just been employees their whole life and they've never actually received an honest kernel of feedback. They've never received the care it takes for someone to say something uncomfortable to them, but necessary for them to grow and improve as a person or in their career. And so all these years have gone by and people have just let these derailing behaviors or these attitudes or perspectives persist in so many humans. And then they come to someone like Ray or myself and suddenly this behavior is in front of us and we're like, oh, oh, <laughs> can we talk about this? Can we talk about this perspective you're putting out there? Because I feel like, you know, you're, you have the capacity to be an incredibly successful person, but if you keep taking this angle or this strategy or, or whatnot, I feel it's going to derail you almost at every case. Has anybody ever brought this up with you before? And I can't tell you how many times they're like, no, huh? And we have that moment and that conversation. And it's just, it's sad in a way, um, but I'm always appreciative when they're appreciative and they recognize the fact that 
they see it, they get it once it's been brought to their attention. And they're actually end up being very grateful. And I and I know that experience because I've been that person. I've had someone care enough about me to check me, right? To bring something to my attention that was potentially derailing so that I had an opportunity to acknowledge it and correct my behavior. I think we have to stress that allyship is is new. It did it didn't really exist, although the, the behavior existed when Michael and I were younger. Um, it did it didn't exist necessarily as it does in the, the corporate space, which is when things are taken more seriously, frankly. Um, in, in general, you see that adoption and you see this word ally. So ally does not mean capitulation. It does not mean subordination. It does not mean you agree on 100%. One of the closest allies in my life is, is Michael. And he. we don't always agree, even 30, 40 minutes ago. But what's important is that we have enough care and we've we've discussed the this issues enough that we know that the common thread is 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 connected um the idea which is important which is also thankfully enshrined in a constitution for us that liberty that freedom and the ability for us to argue without one of us being able to report the other to the state that that's a great place to live right that that's the freedom that exists but you what do you do with that freedom is the question and it doesn't mean you agree on 100% it means that you have the tough conversations and you care enough for that individual and and, and sometimes you have to start with care by the way don't just jump in and start trying to have these really robust conversations and advocacy in your family if your family doesn't have a great conversation structure sometimes you got to figure out more about the care, right? Don't come in hot, figure out how people are doing, show care, maybe over a couple of years before you really get to the root of it, because you should be playing the long game when it comes to these types of topics. This isn't fixed overnight, and we're here to help. No, that's a great point. I would say, if you can, try and rely on questions. Um, it's always more powerful when people feel like they've come to conclusions on their own. And sometimes we can stoke and, and help people come to those conclusions simply just by asking questions, right? Not, not dictating or telling people what to think or believe, um, but expressing curiosity or concern and uh, seeing where that leads someone for themselves. Because at the end of the day, the power of change is only within each of us. It's not outside of us, right? And so it's a choice we have to make for ourselves. I think that's a wrap. We have been your hosts. Thank you to Mr. Raymond Wong Jr. And, and thank you to Mr. Piscatelli. It has truly been a situation that will generate reverse Karens for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 been it's been something that's for sure <laughs> for information on this and other episodes head over to citizendogood.com and click on podcast while you're there hit up the contact us page and leave a comment we'd love to hear from the community special thanks to you our listeners we save the best for last you are the best and you have been for years thank you for your support we know it's painful and we love you Intro music sampled from OK Class by Ozzy Jock under Creative Commons license through freemusicarchive.org. Other music provided royalty-free through Fizzly and Studios Inc.